episode of Progress, Potential, and Possibilities, discussions with fascinating people designing a better tomorrow for all of us. I'm your host, Ira Pastor. Welcome, everybody, again to another episode of our show with another truly fascinating guest who is helping to create a better tomorrow for so many people. Uh, so as a little background, on a previous episode, uh, we were joined by Ambassador Dr. Fernando Lorca Castro, Ambassador of Costa Rica to the United States, who on that show introduced us to the topic of the Costa Rican National Bioeconomy Strategy, which was a new initiative that has a, a knowledge-based, green, resilient, uh, and competitive economy as its model, but which also proposes the applications of various principles of a circular bioeconomy and a decarbonization of various production and consumption processes. Today, uh, we have the honor of being joined by Dr. Paulo Vega Castillo, who is the Minister of Science, Technology, and Telecommunications for the country of Costa Rica, and she assumed this role in June of 2020. Uh, Dr. Vega Castillo was previously the Deputy Minister of Science and Technology and also served as the Vice President for Research and Outreach at the uh, at Costa Rican Technology Institute, Instituto Tecnologico de Costa Rica, ITCR, uh, where she promoted strengthening of research and outreach, uh, linkages with various national and international sectors for increasing scientific publication and patents. Uh, Dr. Vega Castillo has a degree in electronic engineering from ITCR. She graduated uh, with microelectronics and microsystems uh, PhD from uh, Technische Universität in Hamburg, uh, the first woman uh, to ever earn a PhD from that university in that discipline. Uh, Dr. Minister Dr. Vega Castillo, Thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Thank you very much for the opportunity to, to share with you a little bit about this uh, interesting strategy that we're really enthusiastic about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting and exciting topic. Uh, I'd love to start off, as we typically do, like, just by handing you uh, the floor for a few minutes, just to really just introduce yourself. If you could sort of uh, take us back a little bit, uh, if you could talk about everything from, from where you grew up, how you developed this interest in, in science and engineering, and a little bit of your uh, early career in academia, I think that'd be a great way to start things off. Oh, thank you very much. Well, um, uh, when, when I was a little girl in San Jose, Costa Rica, my, my grandfather, he was an electronics technician and um, also a photographer. And he loved to, you know, to repair and to also to adapt uh, technological equipment, for example, for his, uh, for his digital cameras and so on. And at that time, they were kind of mechanical and electrical or electronics at the same time. But now they are more digital. But um, he was always uh, trying to find out new ways to do things and try to adapt technology to his needs. And uh, he had this, uh, this place, uh, part of his room, full of, uh, full of different um, tools uh, related to to this uh, work he did uh, with uh, technology. And I spent really a lot of time with him. He was kind of my, my favorite person. <laughs> yes. And I really enjoyed being there with him. And then I grew up seeing him, you know, uh, really innovating and uh, not, not being afraid of the new technology, but uh, always being curious about how it works and how he could do it better. So from that, uh, I uh, decided to study something that uh, was related to physics. I wanted to study physics, but at that time uh, in, in our country, there were not many jobs related to physics. And therefore, um, I, I kept asking, what is, this, um, what is this option that I will have where I will learn a lot about physics and mathematics and oh, it was electronics engineering, yes. So that's how I decided to do that. And after I graduated, I was hired by uh, Costa Rica Institute of Technology uh, for being an instructor professor. And uh, from, from that, I had the opportunity to, um, to hold a scholarship from the German Academic Exchange Service and therefore went to, to Hamburg to study something which was also related to electronics and that has a lot of physics, which is microelectronics and microsystems. So all the sensors and the electronics and the actuators behind uh, all the electronics we are using. 
So um, after that, then I had the opportunity to continue earning a PhD in microelectronics. And since I always had in mind, I wanted to go back to my country and help a little bit uh, to develop technology in Costa Rica. Then I, I returned to Costa Rica Institute of Technology. And uh, from, from there, I did some projects related, for example, with the creating, creation of the um, uh, research program in nanotechnology, the master's degree in uh, electronics engineering, which is the first uh, master's degree of such type in the country. And uh, later on, as vice president of uh, research and outreach, then I was committed to having, having the opportunity to link Costa Rica to, to, what's, to what was happening uh, in other countries in, in this field in science and technology. And also trying, trying to strengthen these this ties, these this links with these uh, countries and uh, promote the exchange because I, I mean, exchange uh, gave me an opportunity to know Germany and to know how they do the things there, what is their, their innovation and research system. And it, it was really a new, a new way to see things for me. And I think that others also deserve the opportunity to, to see how others are doing things and bring here the, the positive uh, experiences that they had there and uh, improve our own science and technology system. And after that, then um, I was very honored by uh, our president, current president, um, uh, Carlos Alvarado, mm -hmm. who appointed me as uh, vice minister of science and technology. And about two years after that, then as minister of science, technology and telecommunications. And from, from here, I'm trying to, um, let's say, to foster empowerment of women in science and technology. Also to, uh, to continue expanding uh, the development of telecommunications in our country. Uh, also, uh, mm, let's say, also giving, uh, giving our, our country a chance to have opportunities for everyone. So we are from here working on initiatives that can open the doors to technology for many people. Mm -hmm. uh, not only for, uh, because we, we know this is important for the competitiveness of our country and also the economic growth, but also because we think that science and technology are tools for uh, improving the quality of life of people and are tools that can help people also to, you know, to get a better job, to have a different future uh, for, their, uh, for them and for their families. Uh, and also because technology, science and technology are everywhere in our lives. Sure. And uh, we also have, a, we must have the possibility to influence how technology and science are being doing, uh, have been developed in, in time and also that science and technology really, really prioritize our needs as, as people. And uh, from there, uh, we are trying to, to bring the, benef the benefits of, of knowledge to all people in the country. Uh, it doesn't matter if they, at the end, uh, uh, have jobs related to science and technology. Of course, it is important that we want a lot of people doing that. But also we think it's important that people can use science and technology as tools to, for the enrichment of their own activities, productive activities, but also their personal life. So we're trying to, let's say, to foster this from the point of view of more people creating or generating knowledge and creating technology, but also more people using and demanding this knowledge and technology in a more conscious, productive and ethical way. Outstanding, outstanding. And yeah, I, you know, it's, it's interesting. I was, uh, I was reading through 
some of your publications uh, the last couple of weeks. And, you know, you at ITCR, you published on a range of things from uh, laboratory on a chip, the joint replacement, uh, implantable sensors. One of the most fascinating publications of yours uh, had to do with something called spider bots. Uh, where you write about this unique synergy between uh, university, industry, government, aside from the fact that you know, it involves, as you were saying, microelectronics, nanotech, biotech, it's, it's really futuristic stuff. Could you just talk a little bit about SpiderBot? Because I think some of what you write about in terms of these synergies, I think, and we'll get to sort of the bioeconomy next, but can you talk a little bit about this project and how this got you thinking about how all these parts work together for, in essence, creating uh, an economy built around these advanced technologies? Yes. Oh, that was a nice project. <laughs> it's really cool. <laughs> yeah. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, well, the situation was the following. When I uh, returned to Costa Rica after my studies in Germany, there were maybe one or two to maybe one or two people in the country that had uh, similar knowledge that, uh, com in comparison with what I learned. But it was very few people. And, um, you know, if you want to really bring technology forward, you need teams. It's, it's not a one, one person orchestra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You really need people working with you and um, you need synergies and you need all these different ideas and creativity from many people. And also, of course, uh, a lot of people having a, a common goal and working uh, to achieve that. So when, when uh, Intel proposed this project, I said, okay, this is definitely very futuristic for any country. <laughs> Yes, for any country. Yeah. But I saw an opportunity to, to use it as a, as, a, as a base to create that, uh, that workforce for the country. So uh, what I did is, uh, when I heard about that, it was, the idea was to create a miniaturized um, system, you could say, or, or robot, if you, if you wish, that could... Um, assist in the detection and sometimes, but were mainly detection of uh, failures in integrated circuits. And it, it has very, uh, very important, let's say, in, uh, constraints with respect of the characteristics that are required uh, in addition to miniaturization to achieve that. And what I did from that is First, I saw the opportunity to, to have, an, let's say, a research alliance with Intel, uh, with the industry. So it was, it, it was a way to start uh, an, an interesting relationship with industry. Also, uh, I saw the possibility to involve uh, several or many people, not only uh, professors, but also students and also people from many different areas. So it was a chance to have a multidisciplinary, but also transdisciplinary research. And um, also it was, uh, we had the possibility from that to learn a lot and from there to have the, let's say the conditions for other projects that probably will be of, um, less challenging but also very useful, practical, and innovative. And there was also the chance to, um, to involve the Minister of Science, Technology, and Telecommunications uh, with, their, uh, with their policy of fostering uh, emerging fields in technology in the country. So um, I went to the university, knocked a lot of doors, and asked people to work with me. And then I said, okay, uh, you know things I don't know. I know new techniques. I know uh, uh, new knowledge. Let's work together. And we had to start, let's say, uh, buying uh, software licenses, buying equipment, and so on. And we had to work together 
In some cases, some people had to learn how to use the software. Uh, uh, others, we started propagating knowledge. Uh, uh, let's say not only with the professors, but also the professors with the students. And also when I was um, creating this new master's degree, I included a major in uh, microsystems and a major in microelectronics and a major in embedded systems uh, and another major in digital signal processing so that we can bring all together. And uh, we have also then master's students working on this project, not only bachelor students, but now master's students. So it turned out in a very interesting synergy from which we, we had a, a master's degree from with a new master's degree in the country with four majors from which we had uh, set the basis for building new labs in Costa Rica for working uh, together among different departments of the university, which uh, at that time it was uh, something, the, the, let's say the research projects were mainly uh, from people from one single department. It was not very usual to have a lot of departments working in a project. So open that also. And uh, we, we built a prototype, a simplified prototype, which was not as small as we wanted to, to have it at the beginning, because of course, uh, we required very advanced manufacturing techniques. Uh, but we had to provide a demonstration effect. We had to, to show there was a proof of concept. And if we had, uh, better conditions that we could continue working. And from that also maybe draw, uh, call the attention of other groups uh, internationally and continue uh, working with them on this. So we, we developed this first prototype. After that, um, uh, we, we had to stop the, the project for, for several reasons, but uh, the country really created let's say new conditions and research groups and programs around that. So for me, that's the most important part because uh, the, the, let's say the skills, the knowledge and the people that were trained through this are now doing very, uh, very exciting things in industry. Uh, also this research has uh, been continued with the with this knowledge, but for other applications in the university and so on. Um, so for me, it was like the way I, I could, I could make real say, what I was thinking I, I would do. Yep. Uh, when I came with the knowledge, I said, okay, I have nothing. I have no labs. I have no students. I have no degrees in which we, I can, I can teach this at the graduate level. But now we have all that. Yes. Um, so I'm very satisfied. I think that the best heritage of, of this project was the capabilities that the, the country developed. And it's still, it's still getting benefit of that. Outstanding. Yeah, it was a, it was a fascinating paper. It was just, a, it was fun to read. <laughs> um, <laughs> so very impressive. Um, so, Let's go into the, the national bioeconomy. Um, you know, you are leading this very uh, ambitious project. Uh, it is under your leadership of uh, the Ministry of Science, Technology, Communications, but you have to uh, also, you've had to bring in um, the, the Ministry of the Environment and Energy and Agriculture and, and the economy. But aside from all the uh, internal uh, ministries and organizations, you also are, you know, connecting the plan to Agenda 2030, to the, the Paris Convention, Convention of Biological Diversity. Uh, take us, please, on, on a little journey through this, because it is a, a fascinating, truly countrywide uh, initiative. Thank you. Well, um, first, I think uh, we had the thought, this, this, uh, we were thinking about the following. Costa Rica is a natural laboratory. We have in a very small uh, country, a lot of uh, biodiversity, yeah. about 5% of the global biodiversity. And uh, because of that, and because we were, as a country, always interested in uh, preserving the environment, then uh, at the universities, an important number of scientists around, the, around these environmental uh, topics 
has uh, been uh, developed in time. For example, with a graduate and uh, graduate decrease, not only the bachelor, but also graduate decrease and uh, in interesting contributions in research and so on. So we said, okay, we have the lab, we have people that know this lab very well, all these people from the biological sciences, forestry and agriculture and so on, everything that is related to, uh, to the biodiversity. And um, we have another, another thing to consider, and that is uh, about 50%, more than 50% of the Costa Rican territory is covered by forests. So we have all, the, all that richness there. Uh, we had also this um, Na National Institute of uh, Biodiversity in Rio uh, that has been collecting a lot of samples of different uh, plants and, and microorganisms and so mm -hmm. on. And so we said, we have all this, all this treasure, but what are we doing with this? And it was... Um, Somehow, uh, we will say it is strange that our richest regions in biodiversity are the poorest. Mm. Seems contradictory. Yeah. And we said, okay, we need to bring development, uh, social and economical development to these regions out of the great metropolitan area, which are all the, all the periphery of, of, of that area, the coasts, uh, the communities close to the borders and so on. They are rural areas. They have had in time a lot of, um, let's say, economical and technological disadvantages in comparison to the great metropolitan area in the middle of the country. But they, they have the, the greatest and um, the most wonderful treasures of our country. Sure. So that means somehow we have to link those things. We, we want to have a developed country, but also we want that this development, development is inclusive. We really have everyone, we really want everyone to have benefit of this development. And uh, from that we said, on the other hand, we have challenges, global challenges, uh, with respect, uh, which are related to environment, for example, climate change and extinction of a lot of species. And we have a president who is very, very interested in these topics and willing to bring conservation forward. And also to not only preserve, but also what else can we do about this? Mm -hmm. And therefore, he launched the, this uh, national strategy for strategy for decarbonization, uh, that from which he wants that Costa Rica by 2050 uh, becomes a country which is really a zero emission country. But you know, when you talk about decarbonization, mm -hmm. then people will say it's very nice; it would be wonderful. Uh, it's necessary, but it's very expensive. Mm. And how can you, you know, how can you handle this trade-off between economy and decarbonization? And there we said, okay, there is this concept of bioeconomy and circular economy, from which, first of all, we have to be aware that natural resources are not uh, endless and that we should try to, to really use as little as we need from nature. Really what we only need and try to reuse all those natural resources that we already extracted from the ecosystems. So that, from that we said circular economy is very important. So, uh, we said, is it possible that, for example, we, we could use all these uh, waste related to agricultural uh, activities? Is it possible that from this waste, we could get added value? Uh, we will also be solving uh, an environmental problem, but also creating new, uh, new sources of income for the people working in agriculture. And 
Then thinking about all this, we said, and how could science and technology uh, be a tool to enable this? From that, then uh, we launched the, the national uh, strategy for bioeconomy. Uh, from the beginning, we had a close relationship with the German Bioeconomy Council and look for advice and what were their experiences about this topic, what they have learned from having this kind of strategies, what obstacles they, they found for implementing such a strategy and created an our, our own strategy and asked for feedback. And uh, they, they provide us um, very valuable feedback and also uh, validated uh, somehow, let's say, the, the ideas we have, that we are in the right path. So we think that this strategy, it would also uh, contribute to decarbonization, but without having the disadvantage of uh, sacrificing economy. On the other hand, we are trying to reactivate economy. And we said, you could think about several ways of reactivate the economy, but probably the most effective is uh, if you find an, an scheme, scheme in which you can build on top of the existing capabilities and knowledge and, uh, and small and medium companies that mm -hmm. are already there in their individuals. So how can you transform their, their activities, uh, but not bringing a, complete new, a completely new activity, but how can you strengthen and transform this activity that is more sustainable, it's more productive, it's more competitive, and also is environmentally friendly. Uh, and that's what we are trying to do with this uh, strategy. We think that we have been working from the universities, uh, from working on building this uh, human talent related to biodiversity, to biology, to uh, biotechnology and so on. But we need also to open opportunities for those people that can transform that knowledge into new companies, into new services and into new products. So we see this an opportunity to link the potentials and needs of the regions, of the different mm -hmm. regions, with the knowledge we already have. And based on those strengths, then um, we think we can uh, develop this strategy in a very successful way. And also, you know, create this economical value out of that. And helping people by this increased economic value of their activities, uh, new opportunities and uh, a better life because they will have better incomes uh, without moving, for example, to the great metropolitan area and doing other things, you know, leaving their families behind. And so we have seen this effect. People is coming or have been coming to the great metropolitan area because they see no chances in the regions, but uh, they come here and the regions become poorer and poorer and poorer. Mm. And we have to have alternatives complementary to, um, for example, to tourism, yep. you know, other kind of activities. Uh, more than tourism, what are the other things that we could do in this region to create value and to create better living conditions there so that people stay there and can have the chance to be happy there and uh, continue uh, doing what, what they know uh, and they do well, but doing it in a more efficient way. You know, you um, you mentioned the uh, the treasures, the, the national treasures that exist, and and you know one the, one thing I obviously, obviously think of. I, I spent most of my career in the uh, the pharmaceutical industry, and I always have to remind people that you know here is the pharmaceutical industry. It's a, a trillion dollar a year industry nowadays, and it's based for the most part on plants uh, and fungi mm -hmm. and, and microbes from from mainly countries with wonderful biodiversity. Um, just interested, what areas are, obviously you, you, you have a specialty in microelectronics and nanotech. Uh, what are some of the sort of these um, 
natural uh, resources that you're most excited about? Are you interested in uh, medicines? Are you interested in, say, biofuels? Obviously, you have volcanoes as well. Uh, geothermal energy is a hot topic mm -hmm. with that. Well, what, mm -hmm. what, what, what gets you most interested when you look out, say, uh, five years or so with some of these uh, treasures? Well, I think one of the things that we, we want and need to develop is uh, first sustainable fishing and aquaculture. Okay. Because uh, it doesn't make sense just to, you know, to, to go for the fishery and just empty your, empty your seas, yes. Um, and Costa Rica is a small country in land, but has a huge, uh, let's say, uh, surface in the oceans that belong to our territory. Sure. So it, we are also responsible for preserving that. And uh, we think that uh, sustainable fishing and agriculture will not only bring um, benefits to the, to the coasts, but also uh, will allow us to really take care of that uh, part of our territory, which is indeed the largest part. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you see uh, Costa Rica as a territory, you will see that we have more, more surface in the sea, about five times than what we have in land. So we have really a lot of, um, a lot of opportunities also for biodiversity from the sea, uh, in which I think there are still many things to discover and many things that have not still been uh, converted, uh, transformed in products, for example, but we have to make sure that uh, we take care of that properly so that we can really uh, keep uh, these treasures there so that we can also extract, I don't know, for example, new, new chemicals or new substances or new treatments, new microorganisms and so on, you know, transform that in a, somehow in a technological product, but it has to be there uh, for doing that. Also, for example, uh, we, we need that our uh, production in terms of agriculture definitely becomes more sustainable. For example, we have a large pineapple fields, but then we have a lot of problems with the waste of these pineapple fields. Um, currently, uh, I know we can improve uh, how we deal with those with that waste we can convert that in something that becomes a product instead, instead of being a problem. And for example, other things is uh, since we have, a, since we have, a, for example, a lot, a lot of biodiversity here, we can also uh, discover new biomolecules, create you new know, for pharmaceuticals, for, uh, for inks, for, um, other applications, for example, for biomaterials, we could also have possibilities. Uh, I think that uh, bio nanotechnology and biotechnology will find out a lot of opportunities in this, in this case. And of course, uh, the biodiversity has also the advantage that we have a lot uh, to learn from the genetics of this biodiversity. Sure. So that's also an important topic I think we could we could uh, include uh, for our projects in bioeconomy. Last, uh, I think it was about two months ago, um, you, you wrote a piece in the, the Costa Rica news that uh, was called uh, The Pandemic Was Also an Opportunity. Uh, obviously, we were all, all of, our, uh, all of these countries now, we, we experienced the pandemic and we all have to adapt. Uh, could you just talk for a couple of minutes on, on some of the uh, things that you see now coming and we're emerging, thank God, out of the pandemic, but some of the technology opportunities that you see that uh, have come along because of the pandemic and, and some of the benefits that we could potentially achieve now with this new knowledge. Yes, well, uh, first of all, uh, of course, the pandemic has uh, accelerated the digital transformation of our country. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, if you see that in terms of, of uh, distance working, uh, you see that prior to the pandemic, there were about 20,000 people working from home. 
And one year after that, when the pandemic was already there, we have more than uh, 280,000 people working from home. And we have students learning from, from their homes mm -hmm. in a virtual way. And we had research teams uh, using more simulation tools and also communicating virtually. I would say in an even more dynamic way than before with research teams uh, abroad. We have seen people uh, looking for solutions uh, for this uh, pandemic, talking to, for example, Costa Ricans talking to people in other countries. Uh, and it was maybe, the, it would be the first time they will talk to each other, but they are working together as if they will have been doing it, that for years, you know? There was this, this uh, really sincere interest in solving the problem that brought people together and that and virtuality opened the possibility to do that in in real time and also a, in a more um, flexible way uh, in ways which in which you can involve much more people at, at lower costs because otherwise what you would do is a conference or something it has a lot of logistics you have to plan a lot of in advance and uh, it's costly and so on but now you have all these all these people sharing ideas and you know uh, giving feedback to each other at low cost this in in a virtual way so from that uh, we observe the possibilities to create or to yes to create new demand to have a new demand for digital services uh, also that people are adopting these uh, digital services uh, as the result of as a result of the pandemic, maybe prior to that they they didn't even realize the potential that uh, digital transformation has. They they might think yeah it's important it would be nice, but they didn't think, really realize what that meant. And now uh, they see that not only as a as an alternative or as an advantage, but as a necessity. Yes, that will bring. Uh, for the information and telecommunication technologies sector, new opportunities for uh, new markets, new applications, and for increasing their market share. For example, in Costa Rica, during the, this year of pandemic, the information and telecommunication sector has uh, had additional incomes of $200 million. I mean, on top of what they usually earn, they have $200 million uh, more. So, uh, and also, of course, in terms of the biomedical sector, we have seen an increase in 8% in the biomedical sector in our country because of the pandemic. Um, and also, uh, this, I think all this uh, situation made people aware, especially those who are, as we said, in the rural areas, aware that digitalization is important for them and also can be a tool for them. Uh, that digitalization doesn't mean that suddenly everybody has to become a um, you know, uh, computer scientist. No, it means that you use digital technologies in your activities and that you can uh, improve, uh, improve your conditions and uh, strengthen your activities using digital technologies as a tool. So from there, I see a lot, of, a lot of potential. And we think that combining somehow digital technologies to the, as we said, the bioeconomy strategy mm -hmm. are two of the factors that will help us to have a country which is uh, more developed, but also in which uh, development is distributed more equally uh, among regions. Outstanding, fascinating message, and it, it's it's a, it's a fa fascinating uh, set of activities that you're involved in, and um, it's going to be fascinating to watch this unfold over the coming years. Uh, Minister Vega Castillo, any any final messages that you'd uh, like to give, whether they're about the ministry or Costa Rica in general, to the audience? Well, I would say that um, 
we want to be seen, and I think we have reached that, we want to be seen in the world as a country that really cares and values the environment. And that is willing to do something about that. Um, it, and despite the limitations of resources that we have, because we are a small country and still, you know, working on, on, on our development, we have made great progress and that progress, that progress uh, doesn't mean that we sacrifice our natural resources. Uh, I would say that we still have to optimize the way we relate to nature. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that climate change and you know all the pollution we see in the environment, all the consequences we are seeing from that, for example, microplastics in fishes that we eat. Yeah. All that means that we, the only way of achieving a real, a real, um, you say, a real development uh, is to be sustainable. The only way in which we can uh, achieve the goal of better quality of life, for example, as in the uh, ODE's objectives, mm. the objectives of, of uh, sustainable development, the only way is if we, if we, let's say, transform our relationship with nature. When we are also aware that we are not the only ones that live in this planet. Mm -hmm. We share this planet with a lot of uh, living beings that have also the right to have a planet to live in, to live at. So with we, talk a lot about human rights. And I think human rights also involve uh, the right to have a healthy environment to live in. Yes. And, uh, but also we have to think about the rights of the other living beings that share the planet with us. Yes. They, they have the right to live and uh, they have to, the right to not to be, uh, let's say, over, over consumed by us, yes. Um, but also, we, we are not alone here. I mean, everything that damage uh, all the other species at the end will damage us too. So the only way in which we can survive is if we are sustainable. And also that other thing that we have to think is uh, even economists, not only scientists, even economists and politicians recognize that uh, environmental problems, uh, they increase the inequalities among people. And those who will experience the, the worst consequences of this are those who are the poorest and those who are less protected. So we also have to think about that. And the next time we think about, you know, extracting more from nature than what we need. For example, next time that you, that you uh, let the water run and don't care about that. Next time that you uh, throw uh, food to the waste, Next time that you overbuy, for example, overbuy clothes, yes, and then throw uh, to the waste clothes that are still in good condition. The next time that something like that happens or, or is about to happen, think uh, if you do that, mm, you, you are not helping, you're becoming the problem. And we need that everybody helps in order to survive. We need that as, as humankind, the planet need that, and also all those wonderful beings there, they need, they need us. I, I think that would be the last message I would like it's, to say. It's, it's a beautiful message and I, I really appreciate it. And it's, uh, it gets very pointed and, and it gets to the heart of, 
of all of our uh, all of us, not just us, but the the nine million other species that live here with us. So very beautiful way to wrap up. Um, for everybody that's going to be listening to this uh, show on on the podcast or watching on the YouTube channel. You've been listening to Dr. Paolo Vega Castillo, Minister of Science, Technology, and Telecommunications for the country of Costa Rica, leading their very ambitious national bioeconomy strategy, creating a knowledge-based, green, resilient, competitive, decarbonized, and circular uh, bioeconomy uh, for the Costa Rican people and the rest of the world as a model. Uh, Minister Dr. Vega Castillo, it's, it was an honor being able to talk to you and hearing your story. I just want to thank you for, for taking the time to spend it with us. And as we say, thank you for helping to create a better tomorrow for all of us. It's a, it was an honor and it was just amazing what you're doing. Hopefully thank all of us can learn from it. It was a pleasure. And thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you, as I Oops. said at the beginning. Um, well, uh, I am very excited about what the future will bring. I think we can really build a better future. So um, I hope so. I hope so too. It was a great message. Thank you.